This week, we give our first impressions of the 2021 Volkswagen Taos, share an update on the Tesla Model 3 as a CR top pick, and give tips on how to navigate high destination fees, next on Talking Cars. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Mike Quincy. I'm Alex Nizek. I'm Gabe Shenhar. So CR has uh, has some news this week regarding Tesla, and let's just jump right into it. Gabe, can you give us a quick summary? Yeah, at the end of April, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, indicated on their website that the Model 3 no longer has automatic emergency braking. And that happened during Tesla's transition from radar-based uh, system to a camera-based system. So uh, we, uh, in turn, um, removed the top pick status for the Model 3 because, as you know, uh, uh, having automatic emergency braking with pedestrian detection is a prerequisite for a top pick status. We also uh, took away some points uh, in terms of overall score temporarily until things uh, get sorted out. Now, a few days ago, we know that uh, the uh, IAHS or Insurance, Hi Hi Insurance Institute for Highway Safety retested the Model 3 with the new camera-based system. It performed very well, similarly to the way it did with the radar-based system. So in turn, we at uh, CR reinstated uh, the top pick status for the Model 3, as well as uh, we uh, also uh, gave back the points we took away. We normally take into account uh, the IHS uh, crash test results and incorporate them into our overall scores. So Keith Barry has an excellent article uh, summarizing uh, all these findings and all the news. Check it out at consumerparts.org. Uh, and, and just to follow up, we, we asked Tesla whether any vehicles were delivered without functional SCW or AEB or what information the automaker gave NHTSA in order for the agency to make those changes to its website. But Tesla did not answer our questions. So that's what we got going in the news. Which brings us to our next topic. Uh, I can't necessarily speak for Alex or Gabe, but I know I spend a lot of my waking hours thinking about what car would I buy if I had, you know, X number of dollars. And talking about this idea with super producer Dave Abrams, we thought, well, why don't we kind of, you know, bring the price levels down a little bit? Let's not be in like Porsche 911 territory. Let's, let's kind of cap it at about, let's say, $25,000. So, so, so Gabe and Alex and myself, we all had a little homework assignment. We had to come up, what car would we buy if we had $25,000 to spend new or used, a car that really fits your life right now? And I know that Alex, where Alex is in his life is very different than what, what stuff that Gabe and I are dealing with. So Alex, what do you got for a cap of $25,000? Sure. So, um, you, you know, I think I'd probably fit the the millennial bill pretty well uh me and my soon-to-be wife you know we don't have a ton of space and we don't have any kids at the moment so um and we do have a car ready but i played the scenario of if i had to pick one car for twenty five thousand, that kind of fits you know every bill uh and for me that means it's got to be kind of fun it's got to be fuel efficient practical comfortable um you know and have some room uh so going down that list you know for me fun I kind of and I'm a big Forerunner fan, but I kind of had to cut that out. So a car is going to be a little more fun day to day than an SUV. So I started there um, and then a manual transmission for me is kind of a must have if I can have that choice. Um, and then being efficient, it was either going to be small or maybe even a hybrid. Um, and then practical, I thought, OK, so how can I get more space in a in a car? So I went hatchback. Um, and then something that's quiet and has good build quality and all those things. So where I ended up is a used 2019 Mazda 3 Premium with a six-speed manual. And I made sure before I came up with this recommendation that you can actually find one of those. And I, so I went onto the internet. And yes, they are available. It's going to be harder than an automatic version, but they are out there. So that's where that's where I ended up. And, you know, I had some runner-ups along the way, like the Corolla hatchback. You can get a manual transmission. Impreza, maybe a used GTI, but I think the the Mazda three really strikes that that do it all balance. Um, maybe it doesn't hit the the off roading bill that a four runner can, but it does pretty much everything else. 
You know, Alex, listening to your preamble and all the things that you were checking off, I was I was really afraid you were going to like uh, steal my thunder. We'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> but but um, uh, so so I, and and the Mazda three has always been like on the top of our 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 list of, of cars that we like here at Auto Test for mm-hmm. years and years. They've always been able to produce a good small car that was that was interesting to drive. Um, right. But but now now definitely want to hear from Gabe. All right. Well, first, uh, those millennials make way too much sense. Uh, So uh, (laughs) I I have two categories here, used and new. So uh, first, I uh, went into uh, some uh, sites and I was looking for uh, a BMW M5 from around uh, 2003, normally aspirated 5-liter V8, manual transmission. I mean, a car that uh, is uh, luxurious and roomy and at the same time it's a it's a sports car for all intents and purposes and uh and it just uh, should be a ton of fun but you know it uh broke my budget at thirty five thousand dollars about so i uh re- did some uh some um readjusting in my head and uh looking back at some of the cars we tested over the years I uh, really found myself a few times uh, really missing the Jaguar XK. I mean, it came as uh, from uh, vintage 2008, 2009, came as a convertible as an, and as a coupe. I really like the shape of the coupe. Uh, I think the convertible kind of uh, uh, ruins that a little bit. But the car was... Uh, uh, not only stylish, but uh, it uh, drove uh, beautifully uh, with great steering, uh, great handling, not uh, out and out sports car, but uh, very refined, uh, quiet, comfortable ride. That uh, is a classic the embodiment of a grand tour. And uh, Jaguar doesn't make these kind of cars anymore. So I, uh, I found that you can pick uh, these things up uh, for less than twenty thousand uh, dollars I mean sixteen thousand dollars for with less than a hundred thousand miles on them so that's uh that's in the used car category but uh, now let me uh go make some sense here because or as a, as a, as a new car because a used a used Jaguar doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, you, you bet. <laughs> that extra ten grand will be for maintenance. So. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but one thing you did one thing you didn't say, Gabe, is 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 it has a great V eight engine too. Oh yeah, absolutely oh. great. V, I mean, it's like a four point two liter V eight, normally aspirated. You know, it doesn't uh, break any world records in terms of. Uh, acceleration against the clock but the way it feels i mean it's so immediate so linear so uh, and then the sound is fantastic also so yeah that's that um uh thanks for reminding me anyway um now in order to make some sense here okay you have twenty five thousand dollars. you want to uh, get something that's uh reliable practical uh has all-wheel drive and i found myself recommending that to a lot of people who Really, uh, they, they say to me up front, look, I'm not a car enthusiast. I'm not a uh, driving enthusiast. I just need a car, a commuter car that's uh, totally practical and, uh, and I can rely on. And for that, uh, I'd say Subaru Crosstrek uh, checks all the boxes. You might, if you want the, uh, uh, you know, and you want the eyesight uh and uh, you, you might break the budget a little bit over twenty five thousand, or if you negotiate uh, quite well, you you might fit it in the budget. Excellent choices. Yeah, I, I got to say the the uh, the Subaru Crosstrek was also on my short list. Um, uh, but I was also thinking uh, about where I am in my life, and I need something with a certain amount of practicality. My first thought was like a used two or three year old uh, Toyota Rav Four hybrid, really good fuel economy, good. Good reliability. Uh, I could find them for you know with a mileage around twenty five thousand to fifty thousand miles. But one of these vehicles going to last a long time anyway. But then I thought you know I'd really actually rather have something a little bit newer, a little bit more fun to drive. And Alex, you're going to get a great kick out of this. I thought hatchback practicality, good go. fuel economy manual transmission, and there aren't a lot of the. There's not a lot out there except the twenty twenty one. Honda Civic Sport Hatchback. 
to me, this I've driven this car. I love this car. It isn't filled with tons of features. It has all the important safety stuff that we like so much. Uh, the hatchback will hold my bike. EPA estimated 37 miles per gallon on the highway. Uh, likely to be really good uh, for in terms of reliability. And and it 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 fits right under twenty five thousand dollars. So so that's that's the car I would gladly drive every day. Be really happy with it. You know, we we drive off into the sunset. You know, we. With these with these magical cars under twenty five grand, uh, Gabe, y- your car definitely wins the sexy award. Way cooler. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, nothing, no, nothing, nothing but love and praise for for those uh, Jag XK coupes. Um, like you, I had a chance to drive a few of them over the years, and they are magical and marvelous. Uh, although I'd rather be paying the repair bills for either Alex's uh, Mazda or my Honda, but mm, that's anyway. We're moving on <laughs> from there. Anyway, uh, listen, uh, Talking Cars audience out there, what would you buy for $25,000? Let us know at uh, TalkingCars at iCloud.com, and uh, we're probably going to get a few uh, winners that maybe we can follow up on, but definitely let us know. So that moves us on to the next category, and that's what we're driving this week. The car of the week is the Volkswagen Taos, Taos, Taos. Uh, anyway, uh, we uh, we did have some debate about how do we pronounce this thing, and it's uh, it's it's a uh, name for the small town in New Mexico, uh, and it's supposed to be pronounced like house, right? So it's a Volkswagen Taos. Anyway. <laughs> we we rented uh, two uh, from Volkswagen, uh, both top trim SELs, uh, one in all wheel drive and one with front wheel drive. Uh, pricing starts around twenty five thousand um, so, dollars. So, Gabe, uh, fill us in about some of the details uh, that particularly stood out for you about this Volkswagen. And you can now say the name. So first, uh, some background. Uh, the Taos is a sub Tiguan uh, SUV model, and uh, it starts uh, at uh, a pretty uh, affordable level of, uh, like you said, and it, it's supposed to compete with the Subaru Crosstrek we mentioned before, and Mazda CX-30, uh, and uh, and uh, Nissan Rogue Sport, and uh, those uh, that are kind of like sub compact uh, SUV. Anyway, uh, you know, VW has a lot of der- derivatives of the Tiguan across the world, and the Taos uh, is uh, closest to uh, a model that they sell in China. Even though it's shorter than, uh, considerably shorter than the Tiguan, it has a lot of room in the back. I mean, it's just a space wonder. Don't expect it to drive or have the same fit and finish as uh, Volkswagens of uh, a few years ago. And uh, you and I are old enough to remember that. Uh, once upon a time, Volkswagens used to be fun to drive and they used to have nice interiors. Uh, the Taos, uh, also another thing about the Taos is that uh, when you buy a normal, uh, a typically equipped SE, which we will buy uh, very soon, it exceeds thirty, thirty-one thousand dollars 31000 very easily. And at that point, there's hardly any daytime in terms of price between it and the Tiguan, which is uh, a more like a roomier and more refined kind of car. So Gabe uh, kind of just touched about how it drives. And for that, Alex, why don't you fill us in on, on, uh, on, the, on the models that we rented from Volkswagen? Yeah, we are fortunate enough to drive both the all-wheel drive and front-wheel drive versions. And when you're making the decision, I think there are three big things um, you know, that are different between the two. Uh, that we should talk about. So the most important, in my opinion, is the difference in transmission. So the all-wheel drive version gets a dual-clutch transmission, whereas the front-wheel drive version gets a more conventional um, torque converter transmission. Um, Next is the tire size. So our all-wheel drive version had 19-inch tires, um, whereas the front-wheel drive had an inch smaller at 18. And then there's also a difference in um, the rear suspension type. So the all-wheel drive gets a more often sophisticated, uh, you know, multi-link versus a generally less expensive um, twist beam setup in the front wheel drive. So how that all affects the driving experience, um, you know, this, the engine, the 1.5 turbo doesn't have a lot of power. And I think it's got some, some delay off the line when you're, when you're trying to scoot this thing along. Um, But having experienced both the dual clutch really seems to add insult to injury in this situation. So causes a lot of delay. Uh, you know, sometimes I found the engine lugging other times it had the delay and then all of a sudden kind of like launched us forward. Um, so it was very inconsistent and the power delivery is not that smooth. Um, so I think the, uh, conventional transmission does a way better job of just being smooth, kind of working in the background. 
um, and just being more drivable in that respect. And, you know, a lot of times you think turbo plus dual clutch equals fun and not in this car. It was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, Alex, you're, you're, you're being kind. You, you said, you know, the, all, the all wheel drive version with the dual clutch, there is some delay. I was like, holy turbo lag, Batman. I, I, I could not believe that the terrible drivability of this car. And, and you know, it, it's, it's not like uh, we, we always agree on, on, on how we feel about cars. But, you know, and Gabe, you, you probably agree with this. We were totally unanimous in, in, in really disliking this powertrain. Uh, I can't stress enough how disconcerting that uh, powertrain is with the all-wheel drive. I mean, that I mean, for, you feel so vulnerable if you want to cross an intersection. And then you wait, you wait, you wait. And then, bam, it gives you all the power. It's like an on-off switch. It's really not... Uh, uh, there's probably a reason why the all-wheel drive model is delayed, uh, and uh, maybe they're uh, uh, just uh, adding some work and, uh, and uh, sorting it out and refining it as we speak. I think that's also kind of, there's 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 a reason why maybe maybe it's not a good reason but yeah maybe there's a reason uh but but you know so so like it, so it it really is is a kind of a frustrating car to drive but but Gabe what what what, what about the interior do you, you you mentioned in your little intro that you know Volkswagen doesn't seem to be quite delivering the high class interiors that it used to for not a lot of money has has the Taos like uh like changed this uh this this trend for v, VW lately a little bit. Uh, the quality of materials is uh, is is definitely. I mean, it uh, conveys that it's priced. Uh, it's it's designed to be uh, to a price point, and definitely there are less soft touch surfaces there than uh, you'd see in uh, even in the Tiguan. Other than that, uh, the seats are pretty good, and uh, the, uh, the the controls are, are typical VW, which are uh, pretty clear and easy to use and intuitive. Uh, but you expect in this class to find uh, a fairly compromised rear seat and cargo area, but no. I mean, in the Taos, you, it, it's just astounding how much room you have in the rear seat. And the cargo area is, is pretty decent, even though cars uh, chopped off Tiguan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as Gabe mentioned, we will be buying our own model, but uh, we do have some first impressions on this car, consumerreports.org. So check it out and stay tuned for more. And uh, so before we move on, we wanted to take a moment to let you know about the Talking Cars Donation Program. If you're not aware, Consumer Reports is a nonprofit organization, so all the work we do is funded by memberships as well as donations. If you're able to give, it really does help keep us doing the work that we do including this show. You can find out more information at cr.org slash give talking cars. Uh, it all adds up and we really do appreciate your support, which brings us on to the next part of your favorite podcast and mine, your questions. We love getting your questions, text, video, Morse code, smoke signals, ESP. Just keep them coming to talkingcars at iCloud.com. That's talkingcars at iCloud.com. So uh, first up, we have a video question. This is Kevin from Lincoln, Nebraska. Hi, Consumer Reports. I'm a big fan of the show and I had a question for you guys. So I had my 2018 Alfa Romeo Giulia uh, Quadrifoglio in the garage for about a week. And I went out and uh, the battery was completely dead. So I could not open any of the doors or anything like that. Um, should I be concerned about changing the battery? It's only about 26,000 miles on it. And I've, I think it's kind of too early to change the battery because I've never had it on my 2016 Tacoma. I've never had an issue with the battery. So is it something that I need to worry about? So Alex, what do you have for Kevin? Yeah, thanks for your, your question, Kevin. And a uh, nice vehicle choice. The Julia is definitely a, a, an interesting and cool vehicle. But yeah, so I consulted our chief mechanic um, to, to get his opinion on, you know, how long a battery should last these days. And, and he said about four to five years is the average life that you could expect. So for your vehicle specifically being a 2018, it does seem a bit early, uh, but I did a little digging and it seems like you may not be the, you know, the only one with this issue. There are other Julia's out there that seem to be draining their batteries. So some advice I would say, you know, you've probably done this already at this point, but charge it up and, and see if you have the issue again, you know, maybe don't go too many uh, miles on a road trip or anything, stay local, but see if you have the issue. Um, and if you do, then um, maybe the battery needs replacing. You could also 
go to an auto parts store or even the dealer and have the battery tested to make sure that it, um, you know, still holds a charge. Um, and then the last bit of advice, and I think this applies at large to cars these days, is maybe take a visit to the dealer and make sure that you have the most recent um, software running on your car. Because, you know, there's a lot of electronics and computers going. And if something's draining the battery, you know, even though it's just sitting there, maybe something's running and it causes the battery to drain over time. So, yeah, take the car to the dealer, make sure everything's up to date. And I think that applies to to all vehicles these days. An alpha that doesn't start? Who would have thought? <laughs> Yeah, you had it coming a little bit by by going. With I, the mean, car. I mean, I the, mean, the yeah. video the video question was it's like, I've got this Alfa Romeo, it won't start, but I've got this Toyota Tacoma, and it's fine. I'm like, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, that's. A- <laughs> but yeah, I'll I mean, uh, I'll second Alex. I mean, good choice of a car anyway. Quadrifoglio, Julia. I mean, that's car that that's a awesome car to drive. I mean, if I were you, I'd be driving it every waking hour of the day. <laughs> so I don't this, know how you go the- a week without driving it, but. <laughs> this is this is comedy gold. It writes itself. Um, <laughs> uh, Kevin, uh, follow up with us. Let let us know how it goes. Hopefully, you can get the uh, the Julia back on the road and and singing that sweet song. All right. So next, uh, we have one from a uh, question for Brian. Does CR intend to test how EVs perform on long trips when DC fast charging is essential? For example, the Mustang Mach E seems to have problems connecting to Electrify America chargers, which would make long distance travel with this car difficult. So, Brian, you are in luck because one of our number one EV experts is on the show today. Uh, Gabe, uh, enlighten Brian about the state of EV charging around this country. Well, first, uh, let me just say that uh, we're not aware of any particular uh, problems in uh, DC fast charging with a Mustang uh, Mach-E. Now, um, let me just step back uh, a second here because I find myself explaining the charging situation to a lot of people. And... uh, uh, there are a lot of people out there who are ready to uh, maybe jump uh, into an EV, and uh, there is a tendency out there to view uh, charging of EVs uh, the same way that you uh, fill up a gas car. And uh, it's a completely different way, total change, uh, paradigm change here. So let me just unpack the, the charging a little bit. There are three levels of charging. So level one is charging at the normal household current uh, of uh normal voltage of uh, 120 volt. Then you have uh, the most common charging. And according to every uh, survey of EVs out there, 86% of EV owners charge at level two, which is on 240 volt and charge at home with a dedicated uh, charger. Now, the third level of charging is DC fast charging. And that is available only on the go on a long trip in public places where you need to get yourself uh, instead of level two charging which is going to give you about 20 miles worth of range for an hour of charging the dc fast charging can give you depending on where the battery level is it can give you a hundred miles of uh, charge in um, in 15 minutes and uh, i mean to be honest uh, at this point electric vehicles don't aren't ideal for a long a long drive i mean if i want to drive from here to columbus ohio an ev wouldn't be my choice but there are people who are willing to make that compromise and don't mind stopping for half an hour 45 minutes uh, on the road Uh, maybe they they have a dog to walk or something else or they like to take a long lunch or a long bathroom break but uh and and can (laughs) and can uh, charge a car for that long. So that is uh, what you have to do. And uh, and at this point, Tesla does it best because it has the best locations. Uh, pretty much uh, uh, all corridors of any interstate will have uh, will have uh, Tesla superchargers, which are very convenient. And Electrify America is another network, but they, uh, we found that their locations are not as ideal. We have tried anecdotally uh, some uh, fast charging with our Porsche uh, Taycan, for instance. I tried it uh, myself at the Stratford uh, location, which is not uh, far from us. And it's not as seamless as uh, it is with the Tesla supercharging. 
You know, Gabe, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because EVs uh, are, are making great strides. Uh, the marketplace is like slowly coming around to it. But yes, they are, they are not the road trip uh, vehicles of choice. I'm totally with you on that. I know that you, you've driven between, you know, Connecticut and Ohio many times because your son went to school out there. Uh, my sister is in Washington, D.C. So I'm, you know, before before COVID, I used to, you know, cruise down there all the time. I can't imagine the, the drive, you know, taking you know, twice as long because, because of the accumulated time that it would take to, to get it to get a charge to keep going and um, uh, and so but but i mean everyone who wants to talk about evs the the hot topic and we're, we're you know lucky we're, we're consumer reports we're staying on top of this and keep checking back for more ev coverage so next up is uh, a question from steve why are car destination delivery charges going through the roof I'm old enough to remember destination charges of $200 or less. Uh, by the way, Steve, me too. Uh, why are they now $1,000 and sometimes almost twice that amount? Is there any way around them? So uh, podcast regular and overall good guy, Mike Monticello, wrote a great article about this at ConsumerReports.org. Uh, and, and basically to summarize, uh, a destination fees basically help to cover the cost of getting cars from the factories or ports to the car dealerships. Um, but it's not all clear exactly what they cover, how they're determined, and yes, they are going up. Um, CR did an investigation uh, based on the research from the industry uh, data source Chrome data. We found that mainstream automakers increased destination fees from an average of $839 in 2011 to $1,244 in 2020. And that's more than two and a half times the rate of inflation. Now, it, it, it's very mysterious about uh, the, the, the source of this, the reason for this. Car makers say, you know, people are buying more SUVs, there are more trucks, you can't put as many as a carrier, maybe they weigh more, so we got to put more fuel into transporting the cars. Uh, and unfortunately, you can't negotiate directly the destination charge. But what you can do is you negotiate the out the door price instead of focusing on the delivery charges, insist on discussing well, what what is what is the, the the bottom line that you'll take for this car? All all you know fees, taxes, everything included, and and you you kind of you kind of work down from there. So um, you know we 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 understand your pain, we get it, and yes, we see it as we're buying cars for our test program. Yeah, it's just another way of uh, increasing the car price without really owning up to it it's uh and it has nothing to do with a distance from the factory because you can have a, 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 a jeep or a chrysler that will have 1500 dollar destination charge uh, and you only have to haul them from auburn hills michigan as opposed to a car that's made in japan that has to cross uh, the pacific ocean to get here which has a 900 dollar uh, destination charge so it's uh just a an integral part of the car for all intents and purposes and you, the manufacturer, can still advertise a low enough price to appear competitive and then tack on the destination charge, which is completely arbitrary. Right. And, and you know, right now, it really is a seller's market out there. So uh, negotiating for, for cars, popular cars especially, is especially challenging these days. But, uh, but Steve, keep at it. And uh, we'll keep studying destination charges as well as other car prices. So finally, uh, we got to wrap this up with a question from Dan. I keep hearing about owners who wrap their cars in vinyl and then coat them in ceramic ostensibly to protect the vehicle's paint. Do vinyl wraps work or are they just another gimmick? So Alex, we're throwing this one to you. What do you have for Dan? Yeah, Dan, this is a, an interesting question. Um, you know, I've done a little detailing and stuff in the past, so uh, this was a good opportunity to learn something new. Um, so first of all, both of these things kind of have a similar goal, right? The goal of protecting the car's paint. And I'll start by saying that they, they do work, but they have some overlap, but they also serve slightly different purposes. So um, a vinyl wrap, or sometimes you'll hear it called a clear bra or something similar to that, um, is just this very thin, but, you know, very almost optically clear film that gets applied by hand over um, the surface of the car. So usually you would apply this um, you know, on a surface that could see rocks or road debris. So like a front bumper or the leading edge of the hood or something like that, because it literally forms a barrier against the paint and it can prevent things like rock chips and, and that sort of thing. The ceramic coating, uh, again, it's, you know, designed to protect the paint, but it's slightly different. So you apply it um, as like a, in a liquid form 
kind of like a wax. It almost replaces a wax and um, but unlike a wax, it can last if done properly, like four or five years, something like that. So it can be more economical, even though it's more expensive up front. But what it doesn't do, though, like the clear bra is offer that kind of rock chip protection and things like that. So it can prevent, you know, fading paint and things like that it can make the car look newer for longer. That sort of thing. So they do work. And if you're really looking for that, like ultimate protection on maybe about a new expensive car or something, you would typically take the vinyl clear bra wrap, whatever you want to call it, apply that to maybe the bumper in the hood or the fenders. And then you would do the ceramic coating elsewhere on the car to give that final um, kind of coat of protection. So they can work in tandem and they have overlap, but they, they do serve uh, different but similar purposes. And, and the best part about uh, applying the, the ceramic coating is that you don't have to go to a, like a pottery class to learn how to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, you can you can buy the product yourself and you can you can do it at home. I do. I've never tried it, so I don't know, you know, how much different it is than applying a wax. Um, but it's it's a relatively new new technology. And I think a lot of people use it in place of, of a traditional wax that only lasts maybe three months, something like that. Great question. Great answer, Alex. Thanks so much. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode. As always, check the show notes for more information about the vehicles and topics that we discussed. And just a reminder, keep your questions coming. Talking cars at iCloud.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week.